holding out. A lot of material from that department found their way abroad, in particular to the CIA. As reported by the authoritative magazine Canadian Weekly World News, U.S. intelligence obtained a 250-page file on an attack by a UFO on a military unit in Siberia. The file contains not only many documentary photographs and drawings, but also testimonies by actual participants in the event. One of the CIA representatives referred to this case as a horrific picture of revenge on part of the extraterrestrial creatures, a picture that makes one's blood freeze. According to the KGB materials, a quiet, low-flying spaceship in the shape of a saucer appeared above a military unit that was conducting routine training maneuvers. For unknown reasons, somebody unexpectedly launched a surface-to-air missile and hit the UFO. It fell to Earth not far away, and five short humanoids with large heads and large black eyes emerged from it. It is stated in the testimonies by the two soldiers who remained alive that after freeing themselves from the debris, the aliens came close together and then merged into a single object that acquired a spherical shape that began to buzz and hiss sharply and then became brilliant white. In a few seconds, the sphere grew much bigger and exploded by flaring up with an extremely bright light. At that very instant, 23 soldiers who watched the phenomenon turned into stone poles. Only two soldiers who stood in the shade and were less exposed to the luminous explosion survived. The KGB report goes on to say that the remains of the UFO and the petrified soldiers were transferred to a secret scientific research institution near Moscow. Specialists assume that the source of the energy that is still unknown to Earthlings instantly changed the structure of the soldiers' living organisms, having transformed it into a substance whose molecular composition is no different from that of limestone. A CIA representative stated, if the KGB file corresponds to reality, this is an extremely menacing case. The aliens possess such weapons and technology that go beyond all our assumptions. They can stand up for themselves if attacked. This isn't the only time where witnesses in this region report seeing humanoid figures emerging from a spherical object. In 1989, there were several reported UFO sightings in the Soviet Union. One of the most widely known incidents occurred on September 27, 1989. According to the witnesses, a UFO was allegedly sighted by a large crowd of people including school children and adults. The incident took place around 4 p.m. where an unidentified object described as a large metallic sphere allegedly landed in a park. Witnesses claimed to have seen three humanoid creatures about three meters tall with a glowing aura and giant eyes. It was said that one of the creatures had a retractable third eye on its forehead. The witnesses claimed to have seen the UFO taking off vertically 
and disappearing into the sky after a short period of time. The incident was widely reported by the Soviet media at that time, which further added public interest and speculation about extraterrestrial encounters. It's worth mentioning that opinions about this incident vary greatly. Skeptics argue that the sightings could have been misidentified natural or man-made phenomena, psychological factors, or even Soviet propaganda. Alternatively, some believe this event could be evidence of extraterrestrial visitation. Despite the controversy and lack of concrete evidence, the 1989 UFO incident in the Soviet Union remains a notable case in the UFO folklore and continues to intrigue researchers and enthusiasts to this day. There is limited photographic or documented evidence available regarding the UFO sighting that took place in 1989 in the Soviet Union. While there are claims that photographs were taken during this event, no verified or widely recognized photographs have ever been officially released or widely distributed. It's worth mentioning that this incident predates the widespread use of smartphones and digital cameras, which makes it more challenging to find photographic evidence. Regarding documented evidence, the incident was reported in the Soviet media at this time, including the newspapers. However, due to the secretive nature of the Soviet government, it's difficult to ascertain any official documentation or investigative reports on this incident. Most of the available information about this event comes from witness testimonies collected by researchers and UFO investigators over the years. These accounts vary in reliability and credibility, leading to a range of opinions and skepticism surrounding the incident. We will take a deep look into events throughout history and attempt to solve the mystery between the Soviet Union, unidentified flying objects, and President John F. Kennedy. During World War II, the two powerhouses sat on the same side and made decisions together as allies. So what caused them to become enemies so abruptly? The start of the Cold War, tensions and conflicts characterized by political, ideological, and military rivalry between the United States and the Soviet Union. It began shortly after World War II but we will look at a specific event that marks its possible start. No matter how long it may take us to overcome this premeditated invasion, the American people in their righteous might will win through to absolute victory. This conference in 1945, involving the leaders of the United States, the Soviet Union, and the United Kingdom, highlighted the tensions between allies. Disagreements arose over issues such as the division of Germany and the future political and economic landscape of Eastern Europe. This is the first time on record where Stalin voiced concerns to President Roosevelt about some of his people were making secret deals with the Germans. Roosevelt denied the claims and assured Stalin that he or anyone on his team was not making deals with the enemy. The Yalta Conference would be the last time that Stalin would see President Roosevelt in person. Unfortunately, exactly two months later, President Roosevelt passed away and Harry Truman took over office. Hear you about 
Unknown and the flying out. Oh, yes, we discussed it at every conference that we had with the military, and they never had been, never were able to make me a concrete report on you have anything on the subject, sir? No, I haven't, I haven't anything on the subject. And there, there's always things like that going on. Uh, flying saucers, and we've had other things, you know. Three months after the passing of President Roosevelt, Harry Truman worked out a secret deal with the Germans known as Operation Paperclip. This controversial secret deal allowed for Nazi scientists, engineers, and other big names to be absorbed into the United States. These actions gave birth to what would eventually become NASA. It was just five months ago that Stalin made the accusations to Roosevelt about having a secret deal with Germany, and Harry Truman had Operation Paperclip in full swing by August of 1945. By this time, Stalin lost trust in the new administration headed by Harry Truman and decided to absorb some of the Nazi scientists and specialists into the Soviet Union for advancements on military and technological infrastructure. This was a secret Soviet operation under which more than 2,500 former Nazi German specialists, scientists, engineers, and technicians from companies and institutions relevant to military and economic policy in the Soviet sector of Berlin, including 4,000 family members, bringing the total number to more than 6,000 people, were transported from former Nazi Germany as war reparations in the Soviet Union. This was headed by Ivan Serov and Soviet army units under the direction of the Soviet military administration in Germany. It's important to note that the causes of the Cold War are complex and can be interpreted differently depending on various historical perspectives. Differing political systems, the desire for global influence and mutual distrust between the two superpowers contributed to the Cold War. Here's a combination of other various factors. The fundamental ideological differences between the United States and the Soviet Union played a significant role. The United States was founded on democratic principles and a capitalist economic system, while the Soviet Union embraced communism and a planned economy. After World War II, the United States and the Soviet Union emerged as the two superpowers with opposing geopolitical interests and competing spheres of influence. This power struggle fueled the tensions between the two nations. The Soviet Union sought to expand its influence and communist ideology throughout the world, which led to conflicts with Western democracies particularly in Eastern Europe. Both the United States and the Soviet Union emerged in the space race to develop a stockpile of nuclear weapons, creating a constant state of fear and mutual deterrence. Nuclear arms race, the development and proliferation of nuclear weapons significantly contributed to the Cold War tensions. The United States and the Soviet Union engaged in an arms race, seeking to build up their nuclear arsenals and maintain a strategic advantage over each other. The Cold War played out through proxy wars, such as the Korean War, the Vietnam War, and several conflicts in Africa and Latin America. The superpowers supported opposing sides in these conflicts, further escalating the tensions. The Truman Doctrine announced in 1947, outlined the United States policy of containment. The goal was to prevent the spread of communism by offering military and economic assistance to the countries at risk of falling under Soviet influence. This policy heightened the rivalry between the two powers. 
the Soviet Union blockaded West Berlin, cutting off access to the city in an attempt to assert control. This led to the Berlin Airlift. is a story of the Berlin Airlift, the operation carried out by the Royal Air Force and the United States Air Force to supply two and a quarter million people of Berlin with food, coal, and other necessities of life. In June 1948, all road and rail communications between the Allied zones and the western sectors of Berlin were closed by the Russians. By the 28th of June, the only way into Berlin was by air, and the first RAF aircraft started this colossal undertaking. According to many predictions, an impossible one to maintain for any length of time, especially during winter. Aircraft began their ceaseless drone into blockaded Berlin using all available airfields in the western zone. In the first three days, 500 landings were achieved, but with the aid of the United States Air Force, the number of flights rose by October to 600 per day. Sunderland flying boats of Coastal Command were ordered in to supplement the land-based planes. These took off from the Elbe at Hamburg and came down on one of Berlin's lakes. Food, still more food, and raw materials had to be poured across the aerial bridge into the blockaded city. Only one narrow corridor led from the base on the Elbe near Hamburg to the unloading base at Havel Lake in the British sector of Berlin. But in four days of the decision to use them, the first giant boats, each carrying five tons of vital material, were on air transport service. They were soon winging their way daily over the port of Hamburg, destination Berlin. Immediately on landing, unloading commences and the machines are prepared for the return journey. On the return trip, exportable freight was carried and the opportunity taken to remove some of Berlin's sick children for convalescence. Month after month, the tempo of flights was stepped up, and by Christmas, American and British planes had made 100,000 trips and carried a total of 730,000 tons into Berlin. Even cars were transported, but coal, equally as vital to Berlin as bread, was the greatest load of all. Over one million tons have now been flown in. For 10 whole months, a ceaseless stream of Allied aircraft landed in Berlin, where Germans, supervised by British Army personnel, eagerly unloaded the vital supply. Air crews of the RAF and Commonwealth crews from Australia, New Zealand and South Africa, together with their British charter colleagues, all of them played their part with the United States Air Force in maintaining this non-stop operation. A combined operation which on one day landed in Berlin a record load of nearly 13,000 tons. That is equivalent to the normal tonnage moved daily by surface transport before the blockade. A large-scale operation by the United States and its allies to airlift supplies into the city. The Berlin blockade and airlift marked a critical point of confrontation in the early stages of the Cold War. Mutual distrust and misunderstandings between the United States and Soviet Union contributed to the prolonged period of hostility. These are just a few key factors that contributed to the onset of the Cold War and ultimately led to the prolonged period of tension and competition between the United States and the Soviet Union. 
It's safe to say that the technology that the Germans possessed was highly sought after towards the end of World War II. Both nations absorbed German scientists, doctors, and engineers through secret programs at the end of the war. The technology was split between the Soviet Union and the United States and played a major role in the future of both powerhouses. With world dominance in their view and newly acquired advanced technologies, space exploration became one of the main subject matters at hand. After World War II, both the United States and the Soviet Union seized German rocket technology and knowledge. German engineers, such as Warner von Braun, played key roles in the development of rocketry in both countries. This led to the space race, with the United States and the Soviet Union competing to send satellites, animals, and eventually humans into space. German technology advancements influenced the arms race during World War II. The German V-2 rocket technology which had been developed during World War II, served as the foundation for missile development by both superpowers. These advancements led to the development of intercontinental ballistic missiles capable of carrying nuclear warheads. Both sides sought to gain intelligence on German scientific advancements during and after World War II. This knowledge helped both countries in various fields, such as aerospace, electronics, and military research. Western Germany, in particular, emerged as a technological powerhouse during the Cold War. The country's emphasis on engineering, research, and development led to advancements in various industries, including automotive, electronics, and machinery. These technological advancements contributed to the economic growth and strength of West Germany, making it an important player during the Cold War. The V-2 rocket was a significant achievement in rocket technology developed by German engineer Warner von Braun. It was the world's first long-range guided ballistics missile. Germany developed advanced artillery, tanks, submarines, and aircraft during this period. Examples include Tiger II tank, the BF-109 fighter plane, and the U-boat submarines. Overall, German technology from the pre- and post-war era greatly influenced the technological advancements and competition between the United States and the Soviet Union during the Cold War. The U.S. and Soviet Union both sought to acquire and utilize these technologies for their own military and scientific programs during the Cold War. It's important to mention that although Nazi Germany made advancements in certain technologies, their ideology and actions during World War II are widely condemned. In July of 1952, there was a series of reported UFO sightings over Washington, D.C., including around the White House and Capitol. These incidents are known as the Washington, D.C. UFO sightings or the Washington Flap. During this period, radar operators at the Washington National Airport detected unidentified radar blips that seemed to defy conventional explanations. Additionally, multiple witnesses, including pilots and military personnel, reported seeing strange lights and objects in the sky. Some witnesses claimed that they observed objects maneuvering in ways that were beyond capabilities of known aircraft. These sightings gained significant media attention and led to concerns about national security. As a result, the U.S. Air Force conducted an investigation into the subject matter to access the sightings and determine 
if they posed any threat. I am here to discuss the so-called flying saucers. The Air Force interest in this problem has been due to our feeling of an obligation to identify and analyze to the best of our ability anything in the air that may have the possibility of threat or menace to the United States. In pursuit of this obligation, since 1947, we have received and analyzed between one and 2,000 reports that have come to us from all kinds of sources. Of this great mass of reports, we have been able adequately to explain the great bulk of them, explain them to our own satisfaction. We've been able to explain them as uh, hoaxes as erroneously identified friendly aircraft, as meteorological or electronic phenomena, or as light aberration. However, there have been a certain percentage of this volume of reports that have been made by credible observers of relatively incredible things. It is this group of observations that we now are attempting to resolve. Our basic difficulty in dealing with these is that there is no measurement of them that makes it possible for us to put them in any pattern that would be profitable for a deliberate, uh, custom sort of analysis to take the next step. We have, as of date, come to only one firm conclusion with respect to this remaining percentage, and that is that it does not contain any pattern of purpose or of consistency that we can relate with any, to any conceivable threat to the United States. We can say that the recent sightings are in no way connected with any secret development by any department of the United States. We can say that the recent sightings are in no way connected with any secret development by any agency of the United States. Major Keyhole, as author of the book Flying Saucers Are Real, what is your opinion of these new sightings of unidentified objects? With all due respect to the Air Force, I believe that some of them will prove to be of interplanetary origin. During a three-year investigation, I found that many pilots have described objects of substance and high speed. One case, pilots reported their plane was buffeted by an object which passed them at 500 miles an hour. Obviously, this was a solid object, and I believe it was from outer space. Ultimately, the official explanation provided by the Air Force was that the sightings were likely caused by a combination of weather anomalies and misidentified aerial phenomena, such as temperature inversions or reflections. The Washington, D.C. UFO sightings of 1952 continue to be a subject of interest for UFO enthusiasts and researchers. Good evening, my fellow citizens. For a few minutes this evening, I should like to speak to you about the serious situation. While there's no definitive statement from Eisenhower on this subject, it's worth noting that he did show an interest in the topic of UFOs and reportedly inquired about them. However, it is unclear what his personal beliefs were as his public statements and official documents do not provide any conclusive evidence of his personal convictions regarding extraterrestrial life. It is unclear what his personal beliefs were as his public statements and official documents do not provide any conclusive evidence of his personal convictions regarding extraterrestrial life. The alleged meeting between President Eisenhower and extraterrestrials is known as the Eisenhower UFO incident or the Eisenhower alien meeting. According to this theory, President Eisenhower supposedly had a secret meeting with extraterrestrial beings at the Edwards Air Force Base in California. It's important to note that there is no concrete evidence or official documentation to support these claims. The existence of this alleged meeting is based on anonymous testimonies and unofficial sources, making it more of an urban legend or a conspiracy theory rather than confirmed historical events. 
The United States government has never officially acknowledged such a meeting, and it is generally regarded as an unfounded claim. In recent years, two people have come forward with new details involving Eisenhower and meetings with extraterrestrial beings. A former Pentagon consultant named Mr. Good was interviewed and stated that there were actually three different meetings between President Eisenhower and alien life forms from 1953 to 1954. This former Pentagon consultant stated that Eisenhower and FBI officials were able to organize these meetings using telepathic messages. Mr. Good also stated that alien life forms have been visiting governments around the world for decades, and they've also visited many different people from different walks of life. This Pentagon consultant marks the first time on record that someone with this type of credibility has come forward about the Eisenhower and alien meetings in the 50s. He also mentioned that these meetings happened at three different bases across the country, and one of them was Holloman Air Force Base. Prior to this testimony, it was only speculation that Eisenhower had meetings with alien life forms, and it's even been said that there was an alien treaty that was signed during this time. We also came across a Hopi elder named John who mentioned that his family nurse showed him a picture from the 50s of Eisenhower, a blue alien, and herself with the Hopi Mesas in the background. The Hopi Mesas are located in the high desert here in Arizona, and during May of 1953, a controversial and notable UFO occurrence took place in the surrounding area. The crash or crashes that occurred in Kingman, Arizona in May of 1953 may possibly be one of the best documented UFO cases in history. The reports come from all walks of life in reference to this highly controversial UFO crash. It's labeled as one crash, but there could have been up to three. The locals reported seeing up to eight disc-shaped objects that appeared to be in attack mode. Three out of those eight craft crashed in the desert. One of them was completely destroyed as it crashed into a mountainside. The second clipped a nearby butte and was somewhat damaged. This is possibly the craft that the engineer saw and worked on. The third craft was not damaged at all and this could be the craft that was founded by the two men who were eventually chased away by military officials. One of the reports says this alien vehicle may have actually been given to the U.S. government by extraterrestrial entities. The engineer who was flown into Phoenix and driven to the crash site stated that he noticed a disc-shaped object embedded in the desert floor. His job while he was at the crash site was to determine the velocity and speed in which the down saucer was traveling prior to impact. Some of the reports contain testimonies that there were alien bodies that were recovered and some of them were alive. The amount of evidence surrounding this event that took place in Kingman, including the fact that there was a military airfield in the area during this time, not only would President Eisenhower would have known about this, it's highly likely that this is the third site that he visited and could possibly have been the location where the alien treaty was signed. With Arizona neighboring both California and New Mexico, the military presence in Arizona mixed in with the origin of the Hopi in the high desert, this incident in Kingman could have been the location where technology was exchanged and a secret deal between aliens and the US government took place. It's important to remember that beliefs vary from person to person. Without direct statements or documented evidence from Eisenhower himself, it is challenging to ascertain his true thoughts on this matter. We have ignition sequence has started. Pressure. Six, five, four, three. Main engines are go. Zero. And we have... We meet in an hour of change and 
challenge, in a decade of hope and fear, in an age of both knowledge and ignorance. The greater our knowledge increases, the greater our ignorance unfolds. Despite the striking fact that most of the scientists that the world has ever known are alive and working today, of the space race can be traced back to the aftermath of World War II. German rocket technology and knowledge acquired by both the United States and the Soviet Union played a crucial role. After World War II, many German scientists, including Werner von Braun, were recruited by both sides. Their expertise in rockets, particularly the V2 rocket developed by Germany during the war, provided a foundation for the development of space exploration vehicles. The ideological rivalry and political tensions between the United States and the Soviet Union, known as the Cold War, created a competitive atmosphere where space exploration became a symbol of technological superiority and military dominance. Each side sought to demonstrate their scientific and technological prowess to the world. The space race represented more than just competition between the two superpowers. It became a symbol of geopolitical influence, propaganda, and national pride. Space exploration also drove significant technological advancements in fields such as communications, satellites, material science, and computer technology. It's important to note that while the space race began as a product of Cold War tensions, it subsequently led to an international cooperation and collaboration in space exploration. This is a breathtaking pace, and such a pace cannot help but create new ills as it dispels old. New ignorance, new problems, new dangers. Surely the opening vistas of space promise high costs and hardships, as well as high reward. Before we get into the actual story of the UFO that was spotted by the U.S. Senator in the Soviet Union, you have to understand why this is linked to President Kennedy. Due to some recently declassified documents, the name of a CIA official that was previously redacted is also the same person who intercepted Lee Harvey Oswald mail in the months prior to the shooting death of President Kennedy. That CIA official's name is Reuben Efron. Efron's name was also found in another bizarre document that was dated October 15, 1955. This document goes into details about sightings of disc-shaped objects while he was traveling the countryside on a train through the Soviet Union. This official CIA document states that the sighting of these flying saucers were made by three very credible U.S. officials. Reuben Efron, who was the CIA official. The second person was Senator Richard Russell. 
Senator Russell sat on the Warren Commission, which investigated President Kennedy's assassination. The third person was Lieutenant Colonel Hathaway. This UFO sighting by the Senator, the Colonel, and CIA official took place in the Transcaucus region of the Soviet Union. What they observed was two mound-like objects, very circular in shape, were seen taken off one after another. The observer stated that they witnessed these flying disks and they appeared to be shooting sparks of flame before eventually going over the train. All three witnesses said that the craft ascended and their speed increased rapidly. The report goes on to state that once the sighting was gone and the disc were out of the view of the observers, Soviet employees began to scatter through the train, lowering the curtains and refusing permission to look out the windows. All three U.S. observers firmly believe that the craft that they saw on that day were definitely flying saucers. The Soviet Union made significant early achievements in the space race. On October 4, 1957, the Soviet satellite Sputnik became the first artificial satellite to orbit the Earth, marking the beginning of the space age. Today, a new moon is in the sky, a 23-inch metal sphere placed in orbit by a Russian rocket. Here, an artist's conception of how the feat was accomplished. A three-stage rocket. Number one, the booster in the class of an intercontinental missile. Its weight estimated at 50 tons. The smaller second stage took over at 5,000 miles an hour and carried on to the highest point reached. 500 miles up, the artificial moon is boosted to a speed counterbalancing the pull of gravity and released. You are hearing the actual signals transmitted by the Earth-circling satellite. One of the great scientific feats of the age. This event shocked the United States and spurred them into action to catch up and surpass the Soviet space program. In response to Soviet successes, the United States established the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. The Soviet Luna 2 was the first spacecraft to reach the moon and crash land on the surface on September 13, 1959. The mission was a part of the Soviet Union's Luna program, which had the goal of exploring the moon and conducting scientific research. Luna 2 successfully delivered a payload of instruments to the moon's surface, marking the first human-made object to reach another celestial body. It paved the way for future missions and contributed to our understanding of the moon. The Luna 2 mission was a collaborative effort involving various scientists, engineers, and researchers from the Soviet Union. 
The primary objective was to impact the moon's surface and transmit data back to Earth. While the spacecraft itself did not have scientific instruments for data collection, it carried a payload of Soviet insignia and multiple scientific instruments that were ejected before impact. Here are some of the main findings and achievements of the Luna 2 mission. Confirmation of a successful lunar impact. Luna 2 became the first human-made object to reach and crash land on the moon. This confirmed that it was possible for a spacecraft to reach another celestial body and pave the way for future lunar missions. The payload of Luna 2 included a Geiger counter that measured radiation levels during the mission. This provided valuable data on lunar radiation at the impact site. Luna 2 did not detect any evidence of a substantial lunar atmosphere during its descent and impact. This finding contributed to our understanding of the moon's environment. While the Luna 2 mission itself did not directly provide extensive scientific measurements or experiments, its successful impact on the moon marked a significant milestone in space exploration. A U-2 spy plane, owned and operated by the United States, was shot down over Soviet airspace. The mission was to get photographic evidence of military installments and land deep in Soviet territory. This U-2 spy plane was a single-seat craft that was being operated by Francis Gary Powers. While he was conducting this aerial photographic reconnaissance mission, he was shot down by a surface-to-air missile. Initially, the U.S. said that it was a NASA weather mission, but days later, they had to tell the truth because the Soviet Union not only captured Francis, but also provided wreckage from the U-2 crash and surveillance photos of the military bases and surrounding land. John F. Kennedy settles into office as the 35th President of the United States, the youngest man and the first Roman Catholic ever elected to the office. The first president born in the 20th century, he comes to office after one of the narrowest elections in American history. At 43 years of age, Mr. Kennedy takes over the power that for eight years has been vested in Dwight D. Eisenhower, who at 70 was the oldest occupant of the White House. Inauguration Day dawns on a capital that had been almost paralyzed by a full-fledged blizzard. 
Battalions of snow fighters kept Pennsylvania Avenue clear for the squaring in ceremonies. Mr. Eisenhower and Mr. Nixon are present at the conclusion to one of the best managed transitions of power on record. Despite sub-freezing temperatures, hundreds of thousands watched the ceremonies in front of the Capitol as the new president and vice president, Lyndon Johnson, assume office. Slippery streets and stalled traffic cause a delay in the swearing-in ceremonies, a delay which the president and his predecessor pass in serious conversation. Then Lyndon Baines Johnson is sworn in as vice president by fellow Texan, Speaker of the House, Sam Rayburn. The first time, incidentally, a Speaker of the House of Representatives has administered the oath of office to a vice president. Then, ten minutes later, John Fitzgerald Kennedy is sworn by Chief Justice Warren as the 35th President of the United States, with the prayers of four major faiths to support him in office. Fitzgerald Kennedy, do solemnly swear. I, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, do solemnly swear. That you will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. That I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. And will, to the best of your ability, and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help you God. So help me God. Be God. Mr. Nixon and Mr. Eisenhower are quick to extend their congratulations. President Kennedy's speech is brief and stirring. Vice President Johnson, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Chief Justice, President Eisenhower, Vice President Nixon, President Truman, Reverend clergy, fellow citizens. We observe today not a victory of party, but a celebration of freedom, symbolizing an end as well as a beginning, signifying renewal as well as change. For I have sworn before you and Almighty God the same solemn oath our forebears prescribed nearly a century and three quarters ago. The world is very different now, for man holds in his mortal hands the power to abolish all forms of human poverty and all forms of human life. And yet the same revolutionary beliefs for which our forebears fought are still at issue around the globe. The belief that the rights of man come not from the generosity of the state, but from the hand of God. We dare not forget today that we are the heirs of that first revolution. Let the word go forth from this time and place to friend and foe alike that the torch has been passed to a new generation of Americans born in this century, tempered by war, disciplined by a hard and bitter peace, proud of our ancient heritage, and unwilling to witness or permit the slow undoing of those human rights to which this nation has always been committed and to which we are committed today at home and around the world. Let every nation know, whether it wishes us well or ill, that we shall pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, oppose any foe to assure the survival and the success of liberty. This moment
much we pledge and more. To those old allies whose cultural and spiritual origins we share, we pledge the loyalty of faithful friends. United, there is little we cannot do in a host of cooperative ventures. Kennedy, a member of the Democratic Party, ran against Richard Nixon, the Republican candidate. It was a closely contested election that captivated the nation. Kennedy was a young and charismatic politician who was able to connect with the American people through his speeches and media appearances. He emphasized the need for progress and change, inspiring many voters with his vision for the future. One of the key factors that influenced the election was this was the first ever televised presidential debate. These debates showcased Kennedy's poise and charm, contrasting Nixon's more reserved and nervous demeanor. The debates are often regarded as the turning point in this election, with many attributing Kennedy's victory in a part to a strong performance on television. In the end, Kennedy won the election by a narrow margin, receiving 49.72% of the total vote to Nixon's 49.55%. However, Kennedy secured 303 electoral votes to Nixon's 219, giving him a clear victory in the Electoral College. John F. Kennedy was inaugurated as the 35th President of the United States on January 20th, 1961. Kennedy's presidency was marked by a vision he called the New Frontier. This encompassed his commitment to breaking barriers and pursuing progress in areas such as science, technology, education, and healthcare. While some initiatives faced challenges in Congress, the New Frontier laid the groundwork for the subsequent policy advancements. Kennedy strongly advocated for the United States to lead in space exploration. In the early 60s, he announced the ambitious goal of landing a man on the moon before the end of the decade. This led to the creation of NASA's Apollo program. Kennedy faced several international challenges during his presidency. He sought to contain the spread of communism, particularly in Vietnam, where he increased U.S. military aid to South Vietnam. His approach to foreign policy, known as the flexible response, aimed to use a combination of diplomatic, economic, and military means to address global changes. Like his predecessors, JFK was committed to containing the spread of communism around the world. He continued the policy of supporting anti-communist governments and providing military aid to nations threatened by communist insurgencies. JFK emphasized the importance of arms control and nuclear disarmament. He initiated negotiations with the Soviet Union on limiting the production of testing of nuclear arms. Although substantial progress was not achieved during his presidency, these efforts laid the groundwork for later agreements, such as the Limited Test Ban Treaty signed in 1963. JFK solidified the U.S. commitment to defend West Berlin during the construction of the Berlin Wall, reinforcing the United States' support for democratic allies in divided Germany. His strategies aimed to address communist threats while also pursuing diplomatic solutions and building alliances to maintain global stability. Uh, has a decision been reached uh, on how far this country would be willing to go in uh, helping an anti-Castro uh, uprising or invasion in Cuba? Uh, and what could you say with respect to recent developments as far as uh, the anti-Castro movement in Cuba? Well, first I want to say that there will not be under any conditions be an intervention in Cuba by United States Armed Forces. And this government will do everything it possibly can, and I think it can meet its responsibilities to make sure that there are no Americans involved in any actions inside Cuba. Secondly, uh, the Justice Department's recent indictment of Mr. Masferrer 
in Florida on the grounds that he was plotting an invasion of Cuba from Florida in order to establish a Batista-like regime should indicate the feelings uh, of this country towards those who wish to reestablish that kind of administration inside Cuba. Third, we do not intend to take any action with respect to the property or other economic interests which American citizens formerly held in Cuba, other than formal and normal negotiations with a free and independent Cuba. The basic issue in Cuba is not one between the United States and Cuba. It is between the Cubans themselves. And I intend to see that we adhere to that principle. And as I understand it, this administration's attitude is so understood and shared by the anti-Castro exiles from Cuba in this country. Mr. President, uh, your white paper last year, uh, last week, uh, referred in very diplomatic language to the takeover uh, by communists in Cuba. Is it your view that Fidel Castro is personally a communist? Well, he has indicated uh, his uh, admiration on many occasions for the uh, communist uh, revolution. He has appointed a great many communists to high positions. A great many of those, I think, in the white paper, well, rather the state paper, he indicated that two-thirds of those who had been members of his first government had fled Cuba, people who uh, had a strong feeling for the revolution but who were not proposed to who did not propose to see it come under the domination of the communists. So that uh, I would uh, not want to uh, characterize uh, uh, Mr. Castro, uh, except to say that uh, by his own words, he's indicated his hostility to a democratic uh, rule in this hemisphere, to democratic liberal leaders in many of the countries of the hemisphere who are attempting to improve the life of their people and has uh, associated himself most intimately with the uh, Sino-Soviet bloc and uh, has indicated his desire to spread the uh, influence of that bloc throughout this hemisphere. You said that, uh, you pointed out that this government has indicted a pro-Batista Cuban, but I'm not clear from your answer, sir, whether uh, this government will oppose any attempt to mount an offensive against Castro from this country. Could you, sir? If your phrase is to mount an offensive, is as I understand it, that we I'd be opposed to mounting an offensive. Located on the southern coast of Cuba, it gained significant international attention due to the failed invasion attempt by the United States in 1961. The invasion, known as the Bay of Pigs, was a covert operation organized by the Central Intelligence Agency with the aim of overthrowing the Cuban government led by Fidel Castro. The motive behind this invasion was to counter Castro's communist regime, which had strong ties with the Soviet Union. On April 17, 1961, around 1,500 Cuban exiles who were trained and supported by the United States government landed on the beaches of the Bay of Pigs. However, the invasion was poorly planned and executed with little local support. The Cuban armed forces, under the leadership of Castro, swiftly and effectively countered the invasion. Within three days, the invaders suffered heavy casualties and were ultimately defeated. The failed invasion was a major embarrassment for the United States, highlighting its flawed foreign policy and sparking increased tensions between the United States and Cuba. The Bay of Pigs invasion played a significant role in further deepening the antagonism between the United States and Cuba, leading to the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962 and subsequent decades of strained relations. The Bay of Pigs invasion was driven by several reasons. The main reason was the United States opposition to Fidel Castro's communist government in Cuba. The Soviet Union support for the Cuban government was a significant concern for the United States during the Cold War. The United States feared that Cuba could become a Soviet satellite state, allowing the USSR to extend its influence in the Western Hemisphere, thereby posing a threat to US national security. The American government 
particularly the Central Intelligence Agency, sought to overthrow Castro's regime through covert means in order to replace it with a pro-U.S. government that would align with American interests and capitalism. The CIA provided training, weapons, and support to a group of Cuban exiles who had fled the country after Castro's revolution. These exiles sought to regain control in Cuba and welcome United States involvement in their efforts. However, it's worth noting that the Bay of Pigs invasion ultimately failed due to inadequate planning, lack of local support, and the Cuban military's effective response, which had a significant impact on the U.S. and Cuban relations. From April 22nd to April 24th in 1961, there was a crucial meeting between the 34th President of the United States, Dwight D. Eisenhower, and the newly elected President, John F. Kennedy. This meeting marked an important transition of power and a transfer of knowledge between the two different administrations. It signifies a moment of cooperation and collaboration between the outgoing and incoming heads of state. The Camp David summit between JFK and Eisenhower it's considered a significant moment in American history as it demonstrated the importance of unity and leadership, especially during challenging times. The purpose of this meeting was to discuss key national security matters and foreign policy issues. One of the main topics of discussion was the failed Bay of Pigs invasion in Cuba, which occurred shortly before the summit. Eisenhower, who was no longer in office at the time, provided his insights and advice to Kennedy regarding the situation. Kennedy sought Eisenhower's counsel because of his experience and knowledge in foreign affairs. The two presidents spent the majority of their time together engaged in private discussions, during which Eisenhower shared his perspective on Cuba as well as other global issues. The overall outcome of the meeting between JFK and Eisenhower at Camp David was twofold, consultation and cooperation. The summit served as an opportunity for the newly elected President Kennedy to seek Eisenhower's advice and expertise, particularly regarding the failed Bay of Pigs invasion in Cuba. During their discussions, Eisenhower shared his perspectives on the situation in Cuba and offered valuable counsel to Kennedy. While the specific details of their conversations have not been made publicly available, it is known that Eisenhower emphasized the importance of learning from the Bay of Pigs incident and making adjustments in foreign policy. In addition to the discussions on Cuba, the summit also allowed the two presidents to consult on various other national security and foreign policy matters. Eisenhower's experience and insights proved beneficial to Kennedy as he navigated the challenges of his early presidency. While the meeting did not produce any formal agreements or treaties, it did reaffirm the tradition of presidential consultation, where an outgoing president assists and advises a newly elected president on matters of national importance. The Camp David Summit between JFK served as a symbol of continued cooperation between the administrations, even amidst policy differences. It's also important to state that during this meeting, it's alleged that JFK learned about the secret alien treaty that was signed under the Eisenhower administration. The national economy. Later that day, his guest of honor at a Democratic Party fundraising rally at Madison Square Garden. 
15,000 people pay from three to $1,000 to honor Mr. Kennedy, who receives five feet of birthday cake. The party anticipates the actual date of his 45th birthday, but it wipes out the deficit. Mr. President, Marilyn Monroe. It's believed that after the Camp David meeting, President Kennedy shared some of those details between him and former President Eisenhower with Marilyn Monroe. It's rumored that she began to speak on some of the things that President Kennedy showed her at that secret Air Force hangar. The biggest topic that JFK supposedly discussed with Marilyn Monroe is the alien treaty that was signed under the Eisenhower administration and that the United States was secretly working with extraterrestrials in exchange for knowledge and technology to defeat the Soviet Union. of all time and no nation which expects to be the leader of other nations can expect to stay behind in this race for space President Nixon, President Truman, 